Good morning, um, and uh, to all our online viewers, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you may be joining us. My name is Sadia Zahidi. I'm a managing director at the World Economic Forum. Um, AI has been top of mind here in the conversation so far in Davos, and I think top of mind for many of us who have been using the low-cost or no-cost tools that have become available over the last um, year or so. Um, there are, of course, many more things that are impacting the future of jobs, but of course, artificial intelligence and specifically large language models are one big piece of that. And we tried to look at the World Economic Forum as to what some of the impact might be. And we broke down about 800 jobs into 19,000 tasks and tried to understand what might be the impact of LLMs. And overall, 40% of all of those tasks could be impacted. Now that exposure could be either automation or augmentation, but 60% of tasks across those 800 jobs, across those 19,000 tasks are not impacted. And maybe a second point to get our conversation started, um, the jobs with the highest potential for augmentation. So here what you can see is in the light blue are the, job, are the tasks within those jobs that are exposed to automation. In that medium blue, you've got the tasks that are exposed to augmentation, which can be a very good thing. And then there are, in dark blue, the tasks that are unaffected. Now, of course, we picked there just the jobs that had the highest potential for augmentation of certain tasks. And I'm sure our panel uh, will tell us a lot more about their views on this. This is simply one analysis, and there are many others as well. And to guide us through that conversation, I'm going to turn it over to Francine Lacour. Francine, you so over much. to you. Thank you, Sadi. I mean, I'm really excited about this panel because we have industry leaders who will also be able to, you know, give us an insight on exactly how you use uh, some of the AI tools that are available, how you see it changing, and then we also have some great surveys that give us a glimpse into the future of the workforce. So I could not be more delighted to introduce Nicolas Hieronymus, Chief Executive Officer of L'Oréal, Paul Hudson, Chief Executive Officer of Sanofi, Christy Hoffman, General Secretary, UNI Global Union, Azim Azar, Chief Executive Officer, Exponential View, and Joe Uzu Zoglu, the Global Chief Executive Officer of Deloitte. So we're going to have a good conversation to first of all try and figure out what exactly we're talking about, because we're talking about transformation. Azim, you understand this, right, frankly, more than most. You put it in simple words when you talk about augmentation AI. Like, what kind of wave, transformational wave, do you see in the next 12 months, two years, and then 10 years? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Francine. I think we've all been surprised uh, by uh, some of the tools that uh, Sadia referred to uh, earlier on. I think one of the incoming assumptions a few years ago was that uh, AI tools would tackle the routine cognitive work, first of all, you know, the everyday tasks. And what we've discovered through these large language models is they're also applicable to what we might have thought of as creative, discretionary, strategic mm -hmm. thinking. So in some of the research that's come out um, in the past year, we've seen that quite high uh, salaried jobs, quite discretionary jobs in, in consulting and strategy lend themselves to augmentation, productivity improvements when you pair a talented human with these very early, early days um, AI models. A talented human job. I mean, this is what you kind of, so you go around the world consulting, but also you've done surveys on actually how transformational this could be. Well, we recently conducted a survey of 2,800 C-suite level executives, and I would summarize their current feeling about all this as equal parts uh, excited and overwhelmed. They're excited because the use cases are transformative, whether it be in the context of drug discovery or transforming manufacturing by creating digital twins, much more effective and efficient call centers, and you can just go on and on. But there's a lot of hard work to do. There's too much shiny objects right now. There's too many buzzwords. There's a tremendous amount of IT modernization that needs to take place to actually get the data in a state that's usable. There's legitimate issues around privacy. Companies don't want their data leaking out to train public LLMs. There's issues around intellectual property. So I like the way you framed the question in terms of two months, two years, 10 years. We generally overstate the impact in a very short horizon and understate the impact over a longer horizon. This is gonna have a huge impact. It's not gonna be overnight. Paul, are you excited or overwhelmed? 
<laughs> I'm, I'm both, uh, but I'm, I'm in particular excited. I mean, it, it's interesting. The genie's out the bottle, right? It's, it's up, it's out, everybody's using it. Uh, at Sanofi, we have 11,000 people using AI on a daily basis. Um, I talked to a lot of my peers. There's a mixture of fear and security and data privacy, um, but it's, it's up and it's running and it's doing things that are incredible. And I was struck by the comments and the surveys you know, in, in me, for the rock, paper, scissors of it, um, uh, AI beats human, uh, but AI plus human beats AI. And I think we have to get to that point now where we just realize that we have a huge culture change uh, to go through because people are very defensive, people are protecting data, people don't want to share, people don't understand federated learning, people don't understand that my LLM and my algorithm will be so much more powerful, I share more, mm -hmm. and people are not good at sharing inside organizations and indeed across sectors and within sectors. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. For me, we can drug undruggable diseases. No. What a way to start. And it's going to be enabled by large language models. Yeah, and of course, it, you know, it will change depending on the industry. So it's different to Sanofi that if you run L'Oreal, how are you looking? at this again and in what time frame well we are uh, very excited today i mean uh, we've been using ai like everybody for for a long time now to boost our formulation processes to augment our researchers but what we see the possibilities of gen ai as it relates to creativity for example in in its capacity to augment our uh, our, our teams we are a very creative company we invent products we create images and the capacity to use these uh, these models to 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 boost, to boost our creativity is phenomenal, and already we are uh, working on some, you know, some advertising pack shots. We have made the decision not to use uh, uh, fake uh, humans in our in our advertising, but as it relates to uh, to products, to images, we do fantastic things. So I think short term or mid term, because we need time to train everybody. We've already trained 6,000 people, but there's, uh, we have 90,000. Uh, but it will be a fantastic. Uh, uh, augmentation, I think the title of the, of the panel is very well chosen, of, uh, of our employees. So there are lots of things to, 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 to pay attention to, and I guess we'll talk uh, again about it, but, uh, but it's very exciting. Chris, you, you focus, of course, on, on jobs, on humans, on workers. So I don't, how worried are you about not putting, I guess, the, the workers and the humans for this technology? So I represent workers across service industries, including ranging from professional athletes on one side to you know, caregivers and, and cleaners on the other, but also including finance, IT, and call centers and workers in telephone. So you know, everybody's afraid. Um, what does this mean for me? The reality is some sectors are going to be way more heavily, as you pointed out, call centers. That, that's the big one where there's already been LLMs in use for a few years, so we have some data to look at. Um, so I think, and then, and then on the other side, on the media industry, we've seen two strikes this year uh, over like getting the right to negotiate guardrails around the use of their images and, and their, their writing. So I think in the creatives, there's a lot of fear, and they're um, you know, taking steps to address that through, through bargaining. But um, in the other industries, I think there's a mix of this could be great. Some of the evidence coming out of call centers, for example, is, yeah, this makes our job easier and better. On the other hand, like we need the opportunity to sit down and negotiate with the employer to make sure it's fairly implemented, to make sure we get our fair benefit from it. Not all the gains flow to, to the business. Um, that you know it's fair and and that some of the risks are mitigated, including job security. I would say if two-year, ten-year horizon, or t you know, I think it will be more gradual than what people are you know fearing right now and that you know we've seen some of these big transitions in bank work for bank workers for example where many jobs have been eliminated over decades um, and it's been done in a way at least where there are unions which is respectful of you know managing through attrition and early retirement and so on so I don't think it necessarily means a huge displacement right. just a, an adjustment Nicola? Yeah, well, I, I just uh, I wanted to react on the uh, on the employee point of view because uh, what we're seeing, first of all, right now, short term, it's it's a job creator. I mean, half of the jobs of the uh, hirings we've been doing over the last three years have been either related to data or to AI. So it's right now it's creating jobs, and uh, midterm, I see my my teams 
they're all working too much and they're desperately hoping to have some sort of solution <laughs> that helps them you know, crunch the data, come up with better PowerPoints and not waste hours doing them. So I think uh, I really see this, of course, there may be some industries or some type of jobs where it's going to be a, a bit more radical, but uh, I see this as a real way to free time and probably get our employees to have a better work-life balance. I mean, I think Azim stressed me out on Monday where he told me, you know, a room full, including all of my bosses, that I need to be 20% more productive thanks to AI in a couple of years. Well, I mean, you I, may, you may feel that that's pressure, right? <laughs> that, that's certainly what some of the data is showing, that uh, right across uh, job tasks mm -hmm. and categories, you get 20, 30, 40% productivity gains. I think one thing we have to be uh, uh, very wary of is what has happened historically. When we saw automation appear in ma manufacturing in the 19th century in the UK, there was a 60-year period where wages fell relative to economic growth. It was called uh, the Engels pause by, by economists, and we need to learn from history and say, what are the things that we can do to avoid a, you know, a multi-decade situation like that, which did lead to some political unrest where, whereby we got to a better social contract by the 20th century. Uh, but we can go into that with our eyes open. And I think Christie's point about collective bargaining and uh, how well re workers' rights are respected uh, becomes really, really important at this moment. Once we sail through the exuberance of what the technology yeah. can do, we have to keep an eye on the workers' ability to participate in that decision making. Yeah, Paul? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I, you know, I think the, the newspaper headlines are about job losses. But the reality is the nature of work has changed. We all know that. And we, all, we also know that, as Nicholas said, we're recruiting more and more people. They may not be the same people doing the same things, but we try our best to make sure that we can retrain and reskill. Um, but I think there is this journey to more meaningful work. People don't mm -hmm. want to do PowerPoint. They want to be um, weaponized, <laughs> amplified. Do they not? To, um, <laughs> I mean, it's a while, to be honest, me personally, but I understand that it's not my favorite subject to, to get involved in. But, but there's... We don't spend enough time talking about uh, what this will enable that is not possible by human beings. I'll try and give a small example. You know, on my phone, I have all the company's data, coded and protected, of course, 130 terabytes of data every day, analyzed real time, the equivalent of 14 million Excel spreadsheets that would take 60,000 people daily to give me an insight. And I get Instagram reels of where to look in my business for opportunity, for risk, Real time, no human involved in it at all. And our people move from doing analytics to working with insights to doing something to have impact. And the productivity gains that come from that, the speed that comes from that. I worry less, in fact, we have no objective, of course, to reduce the number of people because AI can do that. We have a big objective to increase productivity mm. and we have an even bigger objective to establish more insights that can lead to a, a more valuable delivery of healthcare for patients. And, and that's so exciting. Most of these things can't be done by a human being, not even one good at Excel or PowerPoint. <laughs> the, the main skill. <laughs> For the last 15 years, finally, we're getting rid of it. Joe. I think part of the challenge here is that you know, we're taking what we can see and is available today, and we're trying to project the impact over a long period of time. The environment's not static. In fact, you know, we're on a sharp upward logarithmic curve in terms of how quickly these models are gaining sophistication. So it's a little dangerous to predict too much based on the state of play today. All of that said, it, you have a big debate out there in terms of how this ultimately plays out through sort of a macroeconomic productivity, job creative versus destruction lens. This is going to make work more meaningful. This is going to make people more productive, there's no doubt. This is also gonna take some elements that are currently done by people and allow those tasks to be performed by the AI. Now, in every prior wave of technological innovation, there have been far more new roles for humans created than the old ones that were destroyed. That's still the consensus base case here that ultimately you see more net new job creation. Now, whether it all happens in the same timeline, we certainly don't want a 60-year gap in terms of generations it takes to replace those jobs given the social consequences. But there are some who have expressed a concern that this time is different because the technology is moving so quickly up the curve of human capability that this will not replicate the phenomena of, or the past waves of innovation. And that has a whole host of new consequences associated with it. But 
sort of the smart money best estimate is that over a foreseeable horizon, this is a net job creator. This makes people's lives better. As in the concern, of course, is that you're, you're no longer putting the human with the technology, that the technology could, could actually go past, I guess, human behavior. And there are a lot of also faults. If you look at some of the LLMs we're talking about in the mm. green room, like there, there's still, I don't know whether you need better chips, better, you know, it will just get better, but there yeah. are a lot of faults in what we're looking at now in LLMs. Well, there are. We should also look at what happens with aug augmentation. Um, the, the, uh, when the first chess computers beat humans, for uh, a few years, the best way to play chess was called Centaur Chess. You took a human augmented by the computer uh, and uh, they would beat computers working on their own. That period lasted less than a decade before you're just better off getting the computer to run. And that's certainly been the case in other areas. For example, uh, GPS, when the first GPSs came out, we were better with the GPS, now we just trust Waze. I think one of the challenges that we have to contend with, a scenario we have to play with, is that this augmentation period that we're all excited about around here, only last for a few years uh, as the capabilities of these systems and process change um, eliminates the space for the human. And so we then need to think about how quickly can we create the new jobs right across our economy that will no doubt emerge. And I think that's going to be one of the challenges. And it, so do we understand, again, so I guess the, the concern is that it just goes so fast that a lot of um, chief, chief executives that are not sitting here don't think about this retraining, don't think about actually what the future looks like longer term. Yes, I think they have to think both about the augmentation over the next few years and mm -hmm. the possibility that that turns into wide-scale uh, task replacement and, what, and how they're going to create the new roles. Chrissy? Um, yeah, let me just come in on the, the point that you made earlier about 20% increase in productivity. There has been a study that was published a, uh, about a month ago that said by 2030, the average white collar worker or 80% of white collar workers could do their same job in four days than they do in five. So I, I think when we talk about jobs, we also have to think about should we move towards uh, shorter mm -hmm. work weeks? And as you pointed out, work-life balance, uh, we use, uh, you know, some of the staff at uni uses uh, chat GPT and they're happy to have more time, you know, to get the same amount of work, you know, potentially <laughs> done in less time. So there's not anybody who doesn't think, wow, I could, you know, do my bullet points more quickly without with some support or some other basic simple task. But I do think that going back to the question of, uh, the future, we have to be more uh, have open-minded about reconstructing a work week as well. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that 20% of people lose their jobs. It could mean that we're working four-day weeks. We don't want to replace that experience from the 19th century, where, which gave rise, of course, to the Luddites and, and a whole series of uprisings around the use of technology. Um, you know, we don't want to replace that. We want this to be... Uh, you know, a win-win, you know, and, and that's really our ambition, is to make sure workers are embedded in the process and bargaining has a role. Nicola, four-day week? Well, you know, uh, it's a bit early days, uh, to be honest, because we, we, are, we are look, looking in the future, uh, because we are right now in, in a period where uh, people had started working from home with the COVID, so we uh, bring, we brought our employees back uh, back to the office and they have the possibility to uh, work from home two days a week. And it's very, very important uh, today rather than, you know, before talking about four days weeks uh, is to, to have people work together. Again, we're a creative industry <laughs> and uh, I, I know so many employees and so, of so many other companies at L'Oreal that have been working from, for, from home for months and that have absolutely no attachment, no passion, no creativity. So right now my, my topic is more than before we get this uh, <laughs> fantastic benefit from, uh, uh, from the, the LLMs and from uh, generative AI to, uh, to, have, to, to have people to, to continue to work together. Yet, uh, I know that even if you work three or even if you work five days a week today, you have very long hours at L'Oreal. And I think that uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, if we can get people to uh, work even 10% less and have more time just to think, yeah. to discuss, to spend time at the coffee machine and brainstorm, uh, that would be a fantastic achievement and I, and I truly believe in that. And I think just to move to another topic, something we may discuss and uh, Paul alluded to it, I think this AI, this Genia will also bring fantastic benefits to the consumers uh, in terms of helping them make decisions, uh, helping them treat their health, helping them you know, choose the right beauty products amongst the jungle of products that are there in the market. Uh, that's, I think that's a very, uh, a very, also a very positive uh, 
effect of Gen AI. Yeah, and I want to come back to uh, both you and Paul actually to see exactly how you're using it now, right? And because you're you're dealing with companies with you know, you know specific. Yeah. Sometimes it's all a bit theoretic. Joe, can you give us an, an insight into again what sectors right now are are using AI or augmentation the most, and whether that will change over time? So you're seeing ubiquitous use cases. There are some that have sort of leaped out in front. I'm sure Paul can comment on life sciences, which yeah. is sort of have some companies that are at the forefront here, given the use cases. But this point about the consumer is really important, that ultimately we need to demonstrate that this is going to make real people's lives better. And when you look at the potential of this technology to solve for some of humanity's greatest challenges, this is going to be a big part of the equation relative to climate science. This is going to be a big part of the equation relative to new treatments that extend the sort of length and quality of human life. This is going to be a big part of the equation in terms of food security. And yet, what are we spending our time talking about? It's going to take the jobs away. Uh, it's going to result in privacy concerns. We're sitting here sort of riling people up over the risks. And my fear is that we're in a bit of a race here that we have to win the hearts and minds of society to see that this is ultimately going to be a huge benefit to people so that we don't let the concerns influence the political and regulatory process so much mm -hmm. that too many guardrails are put in place before we ever even get the chance to demonstrate the benefit. Yeah, but we have a whole bunch of elections this year. And as you mean, if you don't take all the workers with you, as we know, it, it polarizes. Right. And so you have extreme politics. Yeah, I think it's a it's a, a balancing act. I think Joe's observation, which is we need to find uh, pragmatic, positive stories about the technology, about the potential of the technology, is is really really important. It's time for a reset about how we talk about AI and augmentation, less about uh, unalloyed fears and much much more about pragmatic, real steps that improve uh, workers, improve the workday, and improve things for consumers. Uh, to, you know, Christie's uh, vision of the, the four-day work week. We can build build on that. Forty percent of Gen Z uh, workers have side hustles. And so you, how do we start to rethink the nature of the employment contract that enables these young, energized, creative people to work, to allow them to keep on their, 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 their side show, show selling secondhand sneakers on Instagram <laughs> or whatever it happens to be. Um, so we have an opportunity actually as part of this technological shift to stick to some nice positive stories that are practical and also start to rethink that relationship between yeah. you know, the worker and the firm. As in, who gets it right? So, in, you know, in terms of politicians, again, these are, we need a big thinker, a big regulator. Like, who do yes, you turn I, to? I, I mean, I, I struggle to find the, um, the visionary politician who, you know, articulates this well from the, the major economies. I think some of the smaller economies, uh, turn to Estonia, for example, can talk about the, the digital transition mm -hmm. uh, in a very, very articulate, mm -hmm. articulate way. But we, we have experts from other countries who may have... Yeah. A better perspective. Paul, give me a sense, maybe you know, concretely. So, what does it mean for Sanofi? So, so in life sciences, there's there's so much that you can do, yeah. with, like you know, if not protein folding, just the advancement of medicine and technology. Yeah, I mean, just before that, I, I don't think there. I think there's a lot of discussion about cloud sovereignty, and about rules and regulations. Of course, there should be. Mm -hmm. But I think it's overshadowing the incredible opportunity that we have. And in healthcare, we believe we're the first uh, healthcare company to use AI at scale. We, we take two approaches. See Alex from in silico in the audience, who may be the first person to, uh, to bring a drug through phase two that was born out of AI. It's never been done before. I think he's got a shot at it. We may work together on it. There is, there are, we, we just simply can't imagine enough chemical structures uh, and biological structures to be able to uh, find a solution. And, you know, about 10% of diseases have medicines, mm -hmm. which means there's so much out there that we just can't find a mechanism to treat. Or we don't understand the pathway. We're changing yeah. that. At Sanofi, so we have uh, two types of AI. Expert AI, which is working on structural biology, uh, trying to improve understandings of uh, inflammatory processes to make, uh, to bring relief for people. That's about 6,000 people doing highly bespoke supercomputing, lots of power, lots of GPU work uh, to do things that have never been done before. Then the other 85,000 people in the company are using what I call snackable AI, which is what I referred to earlier, getting nudged yeah. to make them more effective. And, and, and this is a, a real challenge for people because most of my peers in healthcare just want to do pilots. Mm -hmm. 
not even sure their use cases at this point. They want to do pilots. They're worried about cyber threat. They don't ever want their data to leave the house. They don't understand federated learning and training algorithms, uh, leaving data in safe places, particularly patient data. Which is kind of fair, Paul, isn't it's, it? I mean, you don't want to just, you, it's fair, like, I don't want my example, data to, to yeah, be but I think, everywhere. I think large language models work because they're large. Yeah. And so one of, the, one of the interesting things is, I've got all Sanofi's data, right? I've yeah. got 50 years of toxicology yeah. data. And it means that I have a great understanding of what that looks like. And I can use AI to curate it. Isn't it better in healthcare that all the companies put that data together? Now, when you say that, and then we can make better medicines that are safer, faster. The reality is people go, oh, but it's my data. But the truth is, I don't want to see your data. I just want to train my algorithm on your data so that my algorithm is more effective. So I've got more chance. Oh, and by the way, you can train yours on my data because what matters is more medicines get created for patients. And there is, so we have two levels of stress. One is, do companies really adopt AI? I say no, but hopefully they will. And do sectors understand what working together in a pre-competitive space can do to elevate all boats to do something incredible, certainly in healthcare. D does it definitely help with innovation or if there's not this competition element to life sciences, does it actually stifle innovation? Because we're looking at the same data. Yeah, but I, I think, uh, as with any major industries, a lot of people do things that are very similar. It's who does more with it. It okay. normally wins. I, I think I think this, this era of my data is my thing, you find that your data won't be enough to yeah. train large enough to get the insights that others that share will get. And I think most people haven't made that leap yet, and we will because we see it as a competitive advantage. Uh, Nicola, can you give me a sense, again, you have a very large company and you've touched on this. I mean, it goes from like marketing to training to, of course, how you sell. You know, you can match color foundations easier, which I guess is, is good for the consumer and good for your sales. But can you give us some concrete examples of how you're, you're using some of this technology now and how that will change? Yeah, well, uh, I could give you uh, uh, maybe two or three examples, but quickly. First, uh, you know, as for research, it's AI is an obvious booster. Uh, we are, like many companies, in the middle of a, of a you know, regulation frenzy that forces us to reformulate a lot of our products. And uh, if we were to do it uh, the old way, it would take us a century and we'd never meet the deadlines. So we have uh, AI-powered formulation tools that go four times faster and that invent, to be honest, uh, structures, uh, formulas that our scientists would not have come up with. So that's uh, not only an accelerator, but also a door opener. That's internally. Uh, and then there's what we do for the consumer. I just come back from the CES uh, in Vegas where I had the honor to do the uh, opening keynotes. And uh, first of all, I was fascinated by the amount of innovations that were powered by AI, and particularly in the uh, uh, healthcare uh, domain. But as far as we're concerned, for example, we introduced uh, something called Beauty Genius, which is a converse conversational uh, help for, for women who need to be recommended a beauty routine and that would analyze their face, their hair, and have an exchange, discuss. So it's a human to human or human to AI discussion. And it's extremely powerful in terms of solving a big, a big pain point for consumers. So you have on the one hand, the research that powered, and the other hand, how do we make consumer happier? How we do, do we answer faster their calls? Today, it takes us 11 hours on average to answer one of the 80 million queries we had every year. We'll do it in less than one hour and it will be more accurate. So all these things are things that are powered by AI. And, uh, and we've just opened our L'Oreal GPT to have our safe space for discussion. Uh, so you're not uh, sharing? Discussion. Yeah. I mean, no. You're not sharing across we're the industry? We're not sharing. We're not sharing so much. <laughs> but we have, to, we have to disagree on a few things, uh, Paul. Okay. <laughs> That's why it's a panel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, again, would you, you know, when you speak to chief executives and do surveys, I mean, do they want to share? I mean, sh sharing is better, but then it's, you know, if, if you're competitors and it's not necessarily a, a better outcome overall, or is it? So this is new. Like, we're, we're in, if, if you use your, you know, baseball analogy, the first inning, the initial reaction is to look inward and protect. So the predominant conversation with clients is we want to leverage the technology. We certainly want to take advantage of everyone else's data that's been used to develop the public large language models, but then any use of our own proprietary data, we want to stay within the company's own named LLM. So essentially take your proprietary data and layer it on to the available public LLM to customize it. Now, over time, I suspect we will agree that there is societal value in certain use cases to sharing.
Now, what mechanism exists between industry consortia, right. regulators, government stepping in, that if we can demonstrate that we're actually going to create a better healthcare outcome, mm -hmm. a greater likelihood of solving some disease by taking patient data across a whole host of different organizations and aggregating it, but you know, you then go to lowest common denominator. What happens if you know eight agree to do it and two don't? So that brings up the question of the role of governments, yeah. the role of regulation for those use cases where there's such a compelling societal value to sharing. But uh, Joe, so I spend a lot of time also thinking about climate change and how you have a uniform set of data. I mean, we don't really have a uniform set of data right now. How you collect data, how you so you can analyze, but you could be analyzing different things. We don't even have a uniform set of data within individual companies. Right. So this is part of the problem, is it's easy to talk at 30,000 feet about all of the potential and all of the use cases. If you look at the state of corporate IT right now, you have a lot of legacy systems, mainframes from decades ago, things patched together in manual processes. That's not a recipe to feed in at scale right. to a large language model. So we've got to do the hard work to actually modernize the IT environments. And then we can have the conversation around whether we can aggregate across multiple companies under common data standards. Yeah. <laughs> where, Chrissy, where do you see, the, the, I guess, the most excitement on some of these LLMs and the changes that we'll go through, either you know, regionally or country by country or just like sectors? And again, it's different if you're in life science than if you're, in something, you're working in something else. Yeah, I mean, we represent workers and services. So in science, I can, you know, it's it, it's clear there's a whole other set of potential um, that are very exciting. I think in in services, um, you know, right now there's been very very little um, application of Gen AI at scale in in large service situations apart from call centers. So, and that's been studied. We see a little bit in finance and banking. Um, and uh, of course, of course, for the actors and writers in the media sector, you know, putting that apart, because there is a question of using their image and their voice and so on. And that's, that's kind of a different use case than, um, you know, that that's more about ownership and control over over image, and I think that's a different issue that has to be dealt with in the context of copyright law and, of course, mixed with collective bargaining. Um, but finance and but, banking, so we were just having a conversation with also the, the ECB president. She was saying, you know, how they actually look at data and go through data now is really generated by AI because it's just easier to go through social media to understand how the consumer is feeling. And so it gives us, gives them, they think, better visibility into the data they're looking at. I think that in the finance sector, the, for the workers, it, they've been going through such a long period of impacts through technology. I mean, so not generative AI so much as algorithmic management and all kinds of other tools that have eventually led to a combination of both surveillance on one hand that workers, you know, really do not like. And so that's sort of the old, I don't want to use the word old generation of, of technology because it's very much in effect in a, across a lot of industries and, you know, ranging from warehouses to, to the, a, a bank worker, I think the question of the algorithmic management has been so deeply unpopular um, and not necessarily resulted in more productivity rather than, you know, yeah. control versus, I would say, enhancement. It's yeah. not an augmentation. It's really just we're keeping an eye on you and you're going to really meet certain quotas. So that's been very unpopular. Mm -hmm. and, but I do, there has been a gradual job loss in, in the banking industry because of, you know, ATMs, for example, leading to fewer bank branches in, in the developed world and, you know, more, there's more in others. But so I, I think in finance, there's not necessarily a, um, you know, view from workers that they've, you know, great, we're welcoming this technology. I do think that there is a need. There's a lot of discussion in Europe where there's plenty of unions and yep. works councils and so on to really engage in this process, but it's, it hasn't been like, isn't this great? It has not been that, that kind of experience for them. I'm going to go to Nicola in a second, but Azim, can you give us actually what, you, what you're worried about? I know you're optimistic about AI and some of the solutions, but there are things, we're very optimistic on this panel, mm. um, and, and there are still you know, pitfalls that chief executives, that world <laughs> leaders and C-suite need to look out for. I think one of the, the hardest areas is the unknowability about all of this. You know, we, we, we can't really 
really plan for what will, will happen. And we, we thought that uh, AI would be extremely precise, like a cold Vulcan. And it turns out to be a little bit fictitious, a little bit hallucinatory, and we now have to deal with, with that fallout. We thought that AI would um, not help people be empathetic, and it turns out from recent studies that doctors who use LLMs deliver, deliver their, 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 their news with a higher degree of uh, empathy. Um, we're not even certain whether the general models will always outperform highly specialist models. This has always been the case. The reverse has been true. The specialist beats the generalist in a particular use case. With LLMs, that might not be the case. So I think one of the challenges for any leader is to go into this seeing the opportunity, but also recognizing that nobody, not even the scientists, really understand the technology and how it might play out. And we, that could lead us into making regulating too early. It could lead us uh, into making decisions that we can't we then want to reverse from. Uh, and so we have to figure out the architecture that allows us to explore, deploy, and do all of that safely while continually revising our fundamental assumptions. But uh, Azim, do you have any insight, again, when you look, how do you know a system works? How do you know the LLMs work? I mean, we sometimes, you know, at Bloomberg play around and kind of say... <laughs> we prod them a lot and hope right, they but do. It, but it's, so it's risky, right? Because you it could, they could get it wrong. Yeah, there's I no mean, real way to check that what you're looking at is real. There's, there's no real way to check, but we are making very, very slow progress. And I think part of the challenge of, of there's no real way to check is that at a mathematical level, there's no real way to check. It's not just that it's hard. Uh, and so one of the, the, the questions will be over the next few years, do we develop new technical safety protocols or do we develop new architectures that they themselves are more reliable and deliver that the reliability that we need. Paul's shaking his head. He's saying, absolutely not. Well, they I mean, are reliable. I, I look at our, you know, I referenced the 130 terabytes. I mean, when we started doing full, when I joined the company, the budget process was like 3,000 slides and it lasted forever. Um, and, you know, uh, last year it was 30 slides. It was an AI base case. It's 99.3% to 99.9% .9 accurate for the following year's performance. And we get to make investment decisions for upside. We get to talk about sort of the politics of presenting slides about a budget and trying to everybody sort of hedging. Yeah. We, it can be highly accurate, certainly finan financially. And yeah. in, in with the work with Word itself, it takes some effort to avoid the hallucination. But you, particularly in areas where you have good context, you very quickly can work that out with better prompting. And I don't think there's any yeah. real drama about that. I mean, I Google a lot of stuff that comes up really wrong, so I don't even know. You know, Chad GPT is a whole other problem. Joe. Well, you're, you're honing in on what <clears throat> maybe one of the sort of fundamental thresholds for adoption. This question of how do you know it's right? Right. Well, how do you know humans are right? So let's take a use case, driving a car. Every year, I think the statistic globally is a half a million people are killed in accidents caused by human beings. If I told you that we had a technology driven by generative AI that would sort of only kill 50,000 people around the world, what would you say? I mean, logically, rationally, one might say, wow, you're going to cut down deaths by 90%. That sounds great. That is probably not human nature. If you went forward and said, we're going to use this technology and it's going to kill 50,000 people a year, people generally hold the technology to a higher standard than they hold the imperfections of humans. And so we have a societal issue to navigate relative to what we set the standard at. Are we comparing it to perfection or are we comparing it to the current alternative, which is a very imperfect human decision-making process? But, uh, yes, I mean, I would turn to trusted news sources, right? How do you know it's right? It's like if you're a news organization, you have a number of steps that you need to check and it's checked by humans. You, some of these LLMs, you, got, you just don't know. Like, let's say, you know, if I put what's the best makeup brand in the world, and it's, it, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> what if it doesn't? Say, uh, what if, uh, yeah. But so, what if it doesn't say, right, Rohan? Like uh, how? Well, it means for, that for, I have to understand why. Uh, <laughs> I have to understand why. But it's true. I mean, there are, we all, we've all read about the hallucinations. So uh, that uh, yeah. the capital of Canada is uh, Toronto, uh, because that's what's most commonly found on the internet. Uh, but uh, you know, it's, I guess we'll have to, the, the the system will have to learn. But probably one of the questions is, how, should we at some point tag uh, very clearly what comes from Gen AI rather than 
not from. I mean, if I take on images, I think it's important. Uh, we, uh, if, you ha if we have, uh, you know, uh, fake uh, interviews from any of us, uh, in the next panel with uh, fake uh, Francine uh, uh, speaking and saying horrible things. How do we make sure this is uh, the real Francine? There's yeah. still a lot of questions, and frankly, I'm not capable yeah. of answering them Especially right now. Especially in elections. Especially in the year of elections. So th there are worries. And I think the big question around regulation is should, you, should we regulate the science, which seems hard, or as some panelists have said in a, mm -hmm. earlier, should we regulate the use cases and make some, encourage some and try to f forbid some? Uh, I think that's a, a big question for, for, for the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, Azim actually was really good, so I asked him about hallucinations, like when you Google, well, not when you, when you put something in ChatGPT, and you had a, a, a great explanation, which I understand 80% of it, but it's basically the way that the model's done, right? Well, it, it, it's just that it, it learns the sort of underlying concept, so it learns that, uh, you know, a, a one top university is like another top university, so likely for you, Francine, to, if it gets it wrong, it'll put you at another great university, it won't suggest that you did uh, athletics training at, uh, when you left high school, because that, that's too far a cognitive, cognitive leap. Yep. Um, so, but I think, I think the scientists are making a lot of progress in, in dealing with factuality, but I, just, I think that we can't be certain as to when that, those results will be delivered and put into yep. the systems that, that people are using. So it's di uh, yeah, different in the science world, I guess. It's different. Look, we, we, I don't think we can get to the next generation of uh, a golden generation of science without artificial intelligence. I think it's impossible to imagine What's going to happen? It may take time. We all know that, but I think it's I think it's extraordinary. Just just back to use cases. I'm interested in the driverless car thing. Just to make a quick comment. My daughter lives in San Francisco, and and after 10 p.m. between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. she takes a driverless taxi because it's safer. She would rather be in a fully autonomous vehicle than on her own. Uh, because that's an emotional choice and a fear choice. And I think sometimes the, there's risks of accidents, but there's also, we have to remember, the use cases are very different depending on where we are. I, I, I listened to a, a defense CEO talking recently about AI, and they said, perhaps Nicholas said, we've been using AI a long time in a lot of industries. But, he, but she made this really important comment. She said, you know, uh, because of what the role of humans, she said, look, if a missile is launched against the United States, human beings do not respond. AI responds. You can't accept, intercept a missile flying at 5,000 miles an hour with a human being. AI takes over and AI defend, will defend the United States. If you launch a missile on another country, a human decides. Because AI does not have the moral compass to make the right decision. She said, and, and we bifurcate how we support two completely different approaches on a very important subject, she said, because one a human can't do and one a human must do. Yeah. And I just think the world is going to end up a little bit like that. For us in science, humans can't imagine what could be done to treat cancers yeah. on their own. And we just have to accept that we're going to break new ground yeah. by doing both things. But do you remember the floating balloon? That, that was over the US. I mean, again, I'm sure before launching, it, it was a human that decided that actually, let's hold on to, yeah. to yeah. see what's so. Yeah. And the Americans didn't so, see it because humans couldn't process the volume of sensor data that their sensors would right. uh, produce, right? So they now have to use machines to do a little bit yeah. more than yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Christy? I mean, w when you look, so we have a minute and a half, so I'm going to ask you all of you in, in 30 seconds, what are you watching out for, for in, in developments in AI yeah. and augmentation over the next 12 months? Is there something that you're excited about that we're, could change? We're really, um, you know, I think excited, you know, from a worker point of view would not be the right word to use. I mean, I think that, yes, as part of humanity, we are all, you know, it's all exciting. But, you know, it, the people I represent are, like, anxious to know, what does this mean for me? I think you cannot... And, I, and I, I understand, like, we don't want the anxiety to preclude the progress, if that's the message, yeah. of course. But in order for that anxiety not to preclude that process, they need some um, guarantees, some commitments that they're on that journey together with their employers, that they understand what's happening, there's transparency, they have a role, they have a right, and that they'll be part of the process. Both of, you know, avoiding risks, such as they may be, which could be safety, it could, you know, it could be some level, some training that they need and all of that, yeah. but also 
to support deployment. And all the studies, the OECD study on AI came out and said it's much, people are much happier where they've been consulted and brought into the mm -hmm. process, and they're much more eager to use it. So I think this is where we're at. Like, we want people to be excited, yeah. but we also, we have to address yeah. the anxiety and the fear of, like, you see these headlines, 40% of jobs. Yeah. What does that mean for me? So that's, yeah. Joe, in 20 seconds, the next 12 months? Sorry. I'm gonna go 20 seconds each mm -hmm. to, to finish this off. Well, at Deloitte, we're all in. Um, I certainly understand the fears. We've seen this movie. Right? We can't yeah. stop the technological progress. You mentioned the Luddites smashing this stuff. We've got to embrace it and do it in sort of an ethical, responsible way, but recognize this is moving and it's moving quickly. Yeah. Paul? Look, um, most people are using AI already. I used to go into the street. I can't believe I did this. I used to walk in the street and put my hand in the air to get a taxi. <laughs> How random a chance of me getting a taxi is that? <laughs> I now use Uber because it's, fun, it's more predictable. <laughs> no, it's, it's here. I think it's leadership, it's training, it's support, it's recognition that we have to find the right rules and regulations. But um, it's such a privilege to lead a company like Sanofi at a time when AI is the most disruptive it can possibly be. Well, if last year was a year of extreme fears about extremely unlikely outcomes, I think this year we have a chance to have generative positive practical conversations about the technology uh, right across uh, society. So that's what I'm looking for in 2024. Nicola? Well, I think, <clears throat> I think the key question is trust. In the end, we've been talking a lot about it, is how do we uh, ensure that there is trust at every byte, as in terabyte, and that's uh, data privacy, it's uh, the uh, ethics of algorithms. Uh, I mean, you're talking about, in my domain, uh, skin color, race. There's lots of biases that we have to work around and to, to, to make sure do not happen. So it's, uh, we have to, to, to make sure to work together uh, that to make sure that this great progress, this revolution, uh, doesn't have more downsides. I uh, would add sustainability, you know, the computing power uh, of these uh, Gen AI things is uh, incredible. So everybody's talking about future technical solutions that are gonna make this sustainability problem go away, but right now it's there. So, um, so it's, uh, it, is, it is still, I'm very optimistic and excited, but still wor worrying. And if you add, may I add one last thing as we're talking about workers, because this is the first industrial revolution for white colors. Mm -hmm. A lot of blue colors are actually happy. I'm talking about, you know, representing hairdressers here. There won't be, hair won't be cut by AI, <laughs> but they will use AI to make sure you've got the right hair color. So that's fantastic. <laughs> that's that's happy, happy world. That's Thank you so much, everyone, Thank for you. a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.